Today's episode is brought to you by Mary's Roadside Cafe at the corner of Route 3 and County Line Road. On Wednesdays, the patty melt is half price, and on Sundays, depending on how Mary and Ron do at the lake on Saturday, there's usually grilled trout, which they serve with roasted potatoes, the house salad, and sometimes butternut squash. Mary's Roadside Cafe. Good people, great food, and a killer view of the valley. Episode 5, I Heard the Bell, kind of sounds like one of those hotel bells. I know it's a typewriter bell, but to me, that almost sounds like a like someone needs service. Yeah, it's like Foley for a Wes Anderson movie. Like, give me the, you <laughs> exactly. know. Exactly. Good use of the word Foley. Yeah, number five, I did not know, is a magic number. Hold on. Is this now your, is this going to be a signature bit? I did you do numerology? You. I did. I co-opted you here. I, I loved your bit and I stole it. No, I five loved is I love the five. Yeah, five is associated with. Uh, religion, especially like the occult, you know, like Ooh. the pent the pentagram, oh, you know, right. so like yeah, um, that's scary. <laughs> Wiccans, pagans, and for them, I think it's the five elements. It's like earth, air, fire, water, and spirit. The Christians, what they do with it is they say that it refers to the five wounds of Christ, Whoa, which right. I had to look up what those were because I was not raised in the church, but Right. So nails with the extremities, hands, feet, that's four. Yeah. I think in hockey, you would say those were both upper and lower body injuries. <laughs> Definitely on the IL at this yeah. point. Wow. Uh, I believe you kind of cued me up. You said we have some housekeeping items that we should yes. get off the boards before we get into my tale today. Yes, which I'm very excited to hear. What I want to do is start acknowledging some of the listeners. And so we get reports. Well, it shouldn't be hard. I mean, there's not a ton ton of them. So are we just going to read through their names from top to bottom? We're not for privacy reasons, but what we want to start doing is calling out some of the listeners around the globe who have been uh, listening to both killer shipwrecks and or killer biographies. Cool. This will just become a new running bit. And the places that I'm going to announce, and of course, we don't know who they are. We don't know. The, we don't know their names or anything. Unless it's Brisbane, that kid from Brisbane. who emailed Right. Me. Unless they self-announce. Right. Like if yes. they email us directly or if they tweet back at us, if we did that. You know, then we would know their names, but we right. do know generally where they are from geographically. And so I'm going to read off like a just few country, of or does it show you like what city they're in? It does show you the city. It'll cool. show you the city, which yeah. is great. So I'm going to read off a few of of our listeners of where they exist around the globe. All of the places that I will mention uh, have at least two listeners. I'm not going right. with the one. Like you know, I don't know what the the uh, sort of analogous butt dialing. Like if you accidentally <laughs> get a podcast, like right. well, I didn't thought killer. Or Bogger, I thought I was listening yeah. to Manson. What is I this? I thought it was true Bogger. crime. Just, no, that's yeah. not what I was looking for. Accidentally. So, we welcome all listeners, though, by the way. So if you're joining us by accident, like, please you know, stay. welcome. Yeah. Please stay. We'll get around to some serial killers. Especially stay if you come from some cool city. Yeah. Let's get to it. Peachtree Corners, Georgia. Is that a real place? That's a real place. These are, uh, I'm not making any of these up. That sounds like a hokey, like, high school play that you, like an Our Town type of. Uh, uh, like mm -hmm. that here at peach tree corner but right, the narrator is off to the side wearing a seersucker suit maybe holding his hat and he's going to tell you a story or no or he's a shopkeeper he's got the apron he's got the broom you know <laughs> he's gonna just sort of shake his head in a wry way and and right. reflect on goings on in peach tree corner maybe take off his glasses and wipe his eyes let's now go international hello to our listeners in ljubljana ljubljana is slovenia's capital it's no. the largest city in Slovenia. How did I not know the capital of Slovenia? How did I not know that we had listeners there? Look, we got to start yeah. telling Lizzie to look for sponsors. By the way, we don't have a specific email address for uh, biographies this season, but you can oh. still reach us at killershipwrecks at gmail.com. Oh, so if yeah, you're yeah. the dude or the woman in Slovenia, like, tell us how you found us. Yeah. Would love to know that. Ljubljana. Now, also, hello to the listeners in Nuri, Morn, and Down. 
which is a city in Northern Ireland. Cool. It's right on the main route between Belfast and Dublin. Hello to the listeners in Bentwich, Brandenburg, Germany. Dude, are you making these up or do we really have people listening from these places? I promise you we have at least two listeners in each of these places. I thought it was literally just our two families that listen. Now, hello to our listeners in Wellington, New Zealand. That's the capital city. Yeah, I'd love to go to New Zealand. Yeah, we may have to do a a live pod from one of our listener bases. Those are just some of the listeners around the globe who are joining us, hopefully for this episode, uh, Killer Biographies. But great that we have an international audience. Sounds fantastic. Wish we could meet everybody. Great feature to add to the show. If we're doing housekeeping, Lizzie asked me, it is June now, in case you were not aware, and every June, you and I circle a date and a place where we're going to do our corporate retreat. Oh, we got retreat time. Wow. She suggested a few places. I kind of liked the place last year in Victorville near the Par 3 course. That was kind of a good... um, Yeah, it was very low-key. But to me, it had both like sort of desert topography so we could do sort of our vision quest where we're going with the pod but then it also had part three you know what i mean yeah that's true there's a trade-off i think there's a laundromat attached to the part three which was convenient lizzie was sort of making noises like she didn't want to come this year and i said look with this is we've come the last three years it's been the three of us and it's important where we're able to because part of what was helpful last year is we really sat down and hashed out like okay can we do killer biographies and what's that gonna look like and all that and so it is just an opportunity for some long-range thinking so do you think she would have you know wanted to miss that like that that was a pretty big decision i know that we were up late i know that the strategy sessions were intense but i felt like they yielded something pretty great that's what i'm saying well the magic happens when all three of us are there and so if it's just the two which she was just like look i don't know if i can come this year but here's a couple of good logical locations to me jamestown would be another fun place we can you know visit some of the pocahontas stuff or the up nice michigan yeah you know some people in the up i do beautiful area i think they still have wolves up in the up so Anyway, you and I should start to decide on where we're where we're doing that. Let me give it some thought. I mean, I like the exotic nature of a New Orleans with the music and the food. But then again, I like the nature and the let's contemplate uh, up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So l- let me think about it. Okay. Last week, you teased the episode by saying that it would be as far away from Virginia or from the from the area in which uh, Pocahontas was living. Did you look up the antipode? To- to uh, Jamestown, Virginia. I- I'm glad you used that word. It sounds like an insect. I looked up in layman's terms, what is the furthest point away from Virginia, away from the DC area uh, that what you can it? get? And well, and I also like I limited it to cities, like real places, not oh, like in the, okay. the ocean. Good. Smart. Because I was gonna say, I'm guessing, you know, it's in it's Pacific the Mariana ocean. Trench, like you're yeah. 40 feet underwater. Oh. So the city that is farthest away is Perth, Australia. Oh, okay. That's That's 11,570 miles. I I think this place is going to give it a run for its money. Wow. Let me just ask you this. Have you ever been to India? I have not, but I did see Slumdog Millionaire. Any interest in going? Would love to. It sounds incredibly exotic and like Taj Mahal. Of course, who wouldn't want to take an exotic trip to India? And I love Indian food. Is that too ambitious for the corporate uh, retreat? I think that's a little outside of our budget. How's Terry doing this year? Is like, can we increase our rate card? I love Indian food too. I just know that with my willingness to sort of eat whatever's in front of me, I will have a intestinal parasite within 15 minutes of getting off the airplane. That's Bloody just like flux. Yeah, we talked about it. that last week. The intestine, <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. Just book it. But even if you haven't been there, you know the shape. You know where it is. It kind of looks, to me, it almost looks like an arrowhead or like a shark's yeah. tooth pointing yes. down into the Indian Ocean. Right, like you could put it on a necklace, you know, go on vacation, and you get your India-shaped pendant, you know, off your puka shells or whatever. It looked pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. There's a great onion headline about the kid who shows up at elementary school, and he's got the shark tooth necklace, and, you know, all the other boys assuming, like, yeah, he definitely, like, 
killed a shark during his spring break like that you know there's no way you get a shark's tooth unless you like (laughs) tommy literally like killed a shark over spring break so the part of india we're going to we're going so if you imagine that shark's tooth if you go all the way down to the tip and then a tiny bit to the left so it's on the coast and it's extreme southwestern india that's where i want to take you to in this season since we're not doing shipwrecks this isn't killer geography (laughs) yeah it's not killer geography either it's on the left side of the shark's left tooth. Side. Got it. It's also known as the western side. So it's southwest, extreme southwestern India. That's where we're going. Are you excited to go? Yeah, I'm super excited because it's India. It's so exotic. I have not been to India. I would love to see it. You know, there's a part of my personality, which we've discussed, which does not worry overly about, you know, hygiene or smells right. or good neighborhood, bad neighborhood. There's something about the jumble of Indian life and the extremes of both just all the extra I don't know it just seems colorful and fragrant and primarily Hindu right like- they got all kinds of different religions but here's the, here's the perfect segue I mean you always do it you never fail mm. to guess where I'm going our hero is indeed a member of the Hindu faith a worshiper Hello. of okay. the Hindu faith he was born in April of 1941 1941 Okay. Yeah, not that long ago. Like he could still be alive. He could be. He is not. Is he? <laughs> well, I don't want to ruin the tale. But so he's born in forty-one, and that's six years before India gains its independence from the British Empire. So you still have those guys like Peter O'Toole walking around with those outfits. In O'Toole was there constantly. Yeah. He had the helmet, yeah. whatever the helmet's called. It's like it's a pith like, helmet. Yeah. yeah, exactly. He had the pith helmet. This guy's name is. He goes by the initials TP. TP. Okay. Could be interpreted many ways. Go ahead. Correct. And the last name is Sundarajan. Sundarajan. Okay. It helps me when it's spelled. His name is spelled S-U-N-D-A-R-A. R-A-J-A-N, Sundarajan, Mr. Sundarajan. Side note, on my very first day, I don't know if it was preschool or kindergarten, I came home and my family said, hey, you know, we're all having dinner and they're like, you know, how did it go, bud? Like I was the baby, I was the youngest kid. And I had a two word response, Rajan pushes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that was that was my takeaway. It's economy of words. It's straight to the point. It's like let's not get fluff. Well, but it was fine except for this one time when Rajan pushes. It was like, yeah, that just gets right to it. Did Rajan go on to become some sort of uh, person who reminds you of T. P. Sundar? Well, the end of that name, Sundar Rajan. So, Sundarajan. Rajan. Sundarajan. Yeah, that's like when I said Zinger and you said, no, it's Sam Singer. And I'm like, I know, but the <laughs> yeah. last part is Zinger, and now Good you're boy. saying Rajan. I, yeah. Right. yeah I, turn, I turn the tables on you after objecting last week. Yes, fair enough. Okay, so this guy, TP. For Americans, that sounds like either toilet paper or like a TP that Indians live in. So we're just yeah. going to go with Sundarajan, okay? Perfect. Yeah. He's born in southwestern India. He's born into a Hindu family. They're in the Brahmin caste. So, you know, uh, India has the caste system. Yes. Brahmin is up high. You're you're psyched if you're born nice. into the Brahmin caste. Life is good. It's the so-called priestly caste. And oh, okay. his family is very learned and scholarly Mm -hmm. and his dad is the headmaster at some private school somewhere so that's cool that sounds good (laughs) good setup (laughs) he himself is quite a good student he learns four languages he he speaks tamil t-a-m-i-l Sanskrit? What? And, you know, I'm saying speaks me. I don't know. Maybe Sanskrit's like freaking Latin. Like maybe it's only a written thing. But anyway, he speaks right. or writes in Malayalam. Malayalam. <laughs> Malayalam. And the fourth one is English. Ah, nice. I know English. <laughs> he is a great student. His family lives in the Kerala state of India in the southwest, right down there at the very bottom of India. As a young man, he does the civil service exam and does very well. And he starts out in the National Police Service. Hmm. He, he also then from there moves into the National Intelligence Bureau. 
he's good at stuff like police, security. When Indira Gandhi is the leader of India, he's part of her security team. Right, but this kind of sounds like you're telling me about like one of my parents' friends' kid. Like, okay, so he went to school, he's good in school, he became a lawyer, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, what's, what's TP's claim to fame? Yeah, I, it's a slow burn. It's a slow burn. Very slow burn. <laughs> okay. I literally, I'm like, I gotta remember this guy's name. Who is this guy? <laughs> okay. He's some Brahmin. Like, he's born into a learned family. <laughs> Big deal. What's, what's the pull here? <laughs> it's got a good payoff. Edit the hell out of it and just skip ahead to the part I'm going to get to. In the early 1970s, unfortunately, there's some family uh, emergency. His father is losing his vision. So he has to sort of relinquish the career he had been in, which was intelligence, security, sort of high level police stuff in India. So he's like, okay, I got to, you know, put the career on hold. I'm going to move back to his hometown, which I'm going to try to pronounce. It's Thiruvana Thapuram. Thiruvana Thapuram. Uh, so he moves back there and he says, okay, well, circumstances have caused me to, to take a little bit of a turn. So while I'm down here, let me upgrade professionally. While I'm down here, I'm going to do what I need to do to enter into law practice as, as okay. a lawyer or what they call an advocate. Again, just as he was when he was little, very good student, picks it up very easily. In fact, within a few years, he's actually also teaching at the law school in that town at the same time that he He's, you know, building his legal practice. And is he known in this community as like yeah. a superstar? So he's known in that community as a superstar, and he has some national prominence in India. Some of his cases, you know, he argues uh, cases at all different levels of the Indian courts, and a few of his become right. big national stories. There was a woman who was married to some like cabinet minister, like the transport minister, and mm -hmm. she... Or she wasn't married to him. I think she was like a um, subordinate. She worked with him. And she was accusing him of sexual harassment. And this was uh -oh. sort of before those cases were really going anywhere there or where the jurisprudence wasn't well. But anyway, he did a good job. He that minister had to step down. And so uh -huh. he was in the headlines for that. And then there was another case where there was a woman who was suing for an inheritance. And I guess, you know, the system was somewhat stacked against women whenever this case took place. And so he was seen mm -hmm. as having a pioneering case and a woman getting her fair share in probate and estate courts. Wow. So building a nice, uh, a nice little uh, practice for himself. But here's where we get into the, why we're talking about him. In 2007, he becomes aware of an issue, which is both a tricky legal issue, but it's also very, very, very close to his heart. And that has to do with the temple, which they have in that town. It's like an ancient temple and it's devoted to the Hindu deity Vishnu. You know, like Hindus oh, yeah. have a bunch of different deities and like sub deities and goddesses and all that. And Vishnu is like one of the Mac Daddy mm -hmm. uh, deities. Big He's time. a big deal. The name of that temple, which they have in his area, is the Sri Padmana Baswami Temple. And it's, and, mm -hmm. yeah, take my word for it. And, it's a mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> and their deal there is. is not only do they worship Vishnu, but they also focus on the his sort of like female counterpart, Lakshmi, who's like both his, Lakshmi. like, yeah. she's a goddess in her own right, but she's also sort of like Vishnu's girlfriend, his divine inspiration. I don't know, you know. Anyway, so they got this wow. temple, great temple, very famous site of worship. It's super been old, super yeah. old. And it's yeah. been overseen for centuries by the royal family of that area. You know, India used to be broken into a bunch of different kingdoms and had different royal families. And it's similar to some countries like those royal families, even though they don't have like the political power on paper, they're still powerful. Right. Okay. Right. And so the royal family of Travancore is in charge of like daily operation of the Padmana Baswami temple. They oversee the budget. 
And that's a Hindu temple. That Hindu he belongs temple. To. Yeah, that he belongs to, that he okay. has worshipped at, you know, his whole life. He He's a very holy man. He never marries. He never mm-hmm. has kids. He's like super hardcore Hindu. Like he goes to this temple five to six times a day to pray. Wow. He starts his devotions at 3.30 a.m. on the dot oh every day. Yikes. And also, if you see the pictures, he's like wearing that that like you know we see pictures of gandhi and like the right. traditional dress like he doesn't have a shirt on you know he's got like the he's loin a cloth. man of religion and that's very hardcore dedication yeah so the royal family's running the temple all good they they do some unbelievably beautiful elaborate festivals at this temple the traveling course yeah they they just the they do it right stepping up well these are festivals that have been going on for thousands of years one is called the festival of a hundred thousand lights and it does indeed feature 100,000 oil lamps in and around the temple. It's just incredible visually. Good show of lights. That festival happens only uh, once every six years, but it lasts for 56 days. So it's it's like a bender. Wow. You know, you're going to want to, you know what I'm saying? Now that's a party. It's like, yeah, like Mardi Gras, you know, that's a party. But I mean, this is a party. And it's so beautiful. We got to go. I'm starting to think this is where we do. Yeah, we should do the corporate retreat. It looks coastal. I bet you they got some shipwrecks like right off the coast. I bet the water's warm. Wow. I'm just saying. This sounds like a business trip mixed with a corporate retreat. We should have Lizzie look into how this all works. Travancore. Yeah, just that area. If she could look into that area for us. Okay. Yeah, I like it. In the late 1990s, early 2000, Mm -hmm. there's increased awareness about something particular with this temple and that is that hold on there's something about this temple that sounds very mysterious yeah and a perfect place to hear from you're Perry. so good at that whether you're thinning varnish or paint cleaning wood stains making moth repellent at home or just maintaining industrial equipment terry's turpentine has you covered Terry's Turpentine has been family-owned and operated since 1993. Terry's Turpentine, natural solvents of unnatural quality. All right. So, Dr. Troy, you kind of left a little bit of a cliffhanger yeah. for us before the break. So. Yeah. Well, you did a great job just making it a cliffhanger. Just like, oh, you know, this is like one of the few moments in the entire podcast so far where somebody would yeah. want to stick around to find out what the next moment There's is going a lot to of be. Moment. Don't sell this story short. All okay. Right, go on. Two things. The temple itself, as and you'll go online after this, you'll look at the pictures of it. And what you're looking at, sure, that's been up for, I don't know, 400 years, 300 years, something like that. But the reality is that that site as a site of worship has been active for thousands of years. And more importantly, one of the... It looks like it's on the water. Yeah, I just brought up a exactly. photo. Doesn't it look oh, nice? Wow. And just imagine it with a th- in the evening or nighttime with a thou- 100,000 I mean, oil incredible. lamps. This um, devotion to Vishnu, the worship of Vishnu, Vishnu has been going on for thousands of years. More to our point, worshipers, especially ones who feel that they've been blessed and this lifetime that they've been given great bounty something good has happened to them they across thousands of years bring really pretty lavish gifts to vishnu and in the late 1990s and in the early 2000s there's some growing awareness like okay there's a lot of treasure in this temple and it's hidden and it's unclear People start to ask questions like there, you know, there's some security guard staff. People are like, oh, you know, I noticed that one thing on the display, that beautiful ivory, that beautiful ivory. Yeah. No. Well, they were like, it used to have literally like gold and diamond rings on the, and those have been swapped out for cheap ones. Mm. You know, people just start to ask questions like who's running this? How tight is the security? What's in the vaults underneath this temple? Like what's going on here? And what year was this? So people start to ask the questions for real in 2007 somebody files a lawsuit this 
church has been there for thousands of years. Yeah, well, the, the, the current church has been there for hundreds of years, but the treasure that's been amassing has amassed over thousands of years. Because the they're site— just not, They're just asking a question now. Yeah, they're asking a question like, okay, first of all, what's the proper relationship of this royal family of Travancore to this temple, and more to the point, to all the treasure underneath? And the royal family, unsurprisingly, when a lawsuit is first filed asking these questions, the royal family's position is, we own all of it. We own the temple, we own the treasure, we own, and we also run it. Is that true? The royal family owns the church? Well, that's that was their position. Wow. Bold. The person who filed the lawsuit says, well, no, that can't be, because a fun fact of Indian law is that Vishnu, as powerful as he is, as supreme a deity as he is, he is treated under Indian law as a minor, like a child. Oh, really? Yeah. So it's like he can have interests before the court, like in this case, well, wait a minute, maybe all that gold and silver and diamonds belongs to Vishnu. No. Yeah. So somebody will speak on Vishnu's behalf, but they have to speak on his behalf because he can't, you oh, know, at least not in court and in a form that we would recognize as a human. So there's a there's a good robust debate, but it's not really catching the headlines until this guy Sundarajan joins oh, the no case way. in 2009. What is his position? Who does he think has access to the treasure? He says okay, it cannot be the case that this royal family owns all the treasure. That belongs to Vishnu. And he says, at bare minimum, what the court needs to do is make a ruling, and but also more importantly, before anything can happen, there needs to be an audit. Like they need to go in, they need to appoint a team that will go down and do a careful inventory of all of the vaults underneath the temple. But isn't this the type of thing that you think would have been raided over the years? Like, I mean, they're just now like, oh, exactly. yeah, wait a yeah, there's probably, it probably, you know, there has been some raiding, but the vaults are sort of like literally almost what you would picture from like an Indiana Jones movie. Like they're not easy to get into. Right. And in fact, one of the, si- there's six vaults. They're like huge chambers, rooms. Wow. One of them, they're just unable to open. They still have not gotten oh into that gosh. one. Wow. But on that day in 2011, when Sundarajan is successful and part of what made him such a powerful advocate was that he was also known as like the holiest of holy men. Right. And he was a lawyer. And his yeah. own Looking law office. In the morning. I mean, come on. Yeah, and his own law office was on the grounds of that temple of that like sort of compound oh my God. and when you see the picture of him he just looks the part he's like at the crazy long like white beard and he's got like he has sort of like charles manson eyes you know what i mean but they're like lit up with like the goodness of right you know and he just he's right. he's like mad for vishnu right he also does the thing it's called a tilaka it's like they paint this thing that looks like a trident on the forehead of the yes, person i'm seeing that he's a very powerful advocate Kid, and he does win uh, a ruling that, yes. I'm seeing him without a shirt. He doesn't look powerful from a physical stature. Intimidating from a, like, yeah, but a scary I, look. <laughs> but yeah, like Gandhi. You know, it wasn't a gun show with Gandhi, but he brought down the British Empire. Right. He's fantastic. I, I'm all about him. But I'm just saying, like, this guy looks scary. Don't sleep on the slender, um, half-dressed Indian lawyers. <laughs> um, Not questioning his intelligence. I'm just saying he looks... A little scary. It looks a little like crazy. A so yeah, the court says, "Yeah, we're gonna do that. We're gonna we're gonna send a team down in there. We're gonna go through the vaults one by one. They're gonna make a careful listing of everything that's in there, and and we're gonna continue to study this question of who owns it, who runs it. You know, that day is like described. Yeah, exactly. But it's on land. That day." The, the other people who were there say, you know, it it was hands down the most incredible moment of their lives because wow. it far surpassed anything anybody was expecting over thousands of years. And so there are, are literally like, you know, three, four, five 
foot tall statues made of pure gold. There's diamonds and and jewels that used to be in boxes and all the boxes have disintegrated into dust. And so it's just all the jewels on the floor of this place. Oh, the one, the, a conservative estimate, even without having gotten into that final vault, the con- most conservative, the most conservative estimate in US dollars is there's at least $20 billion of treasure underneath this temple and they haven't even gotten into the final vault the final vault there's like three layers of doors Um, and you know the other thing that's going on is that people as fast like you and i come at it from the shipwreck school where it's like oh man let's see the pictures of the jewels or how much is it worth or whatever it's a real hot button it's sort of like the way abortion is in america just as a hot button issue this thing ends up being because people are like that is Vishnu stuff. It's not to be touched. We shouldn't even be looking at it. They say, you know, right. they're stirring up bad juju. They say the people that are down in those vaults looking at all that stuff, they're going to have the curse of the cobra on them. Like anybody who goes into those vaults, like that is not going to be good for them. That's one of those things where it's like just to have a cobra on you, that's a curse. But when you're saying the curse Sounds of the Sounds even worse, cobra. right? I wonder if the curse of the cobra is that scene in Indiana Jones where it's just like an entire floor oh, covered with writhing nice snakes. Man. That scene right. with the snakes all over the ground, that was I was shocked because I had had already had that anxiety dream over and over again of like the the ground just covered with snakes. And to see it in a movie, I was like, oh my God, I dream that. Anyway, okay, but you know who's the one person who's not super impressed that day? Our hero, Sundarajan, they said, compared to all the other people walking through and ooing and eyeing over the objects, he couldn't have been less interested in the sumptuousness of the display or the amount of wealth that was amassed. He was like a bookkeeper about it. He was like, you know, we just, we take the pictures, we describe it, we record it. We like, he's just not that guy. He could not care less about money. He like, he barely eats any food all day long. He's praying all day long. But, you know, there's also an incredible backlash. He goes from being a favorite son in that area to a lot of his hometown people like, dude, what the that's Vishnu stuff. Now the world media is here. Now there's this big fight over whether the royal family should still have this important role. And guess what Sundarajan yeah. does three weeks later? Keel's over dead. No. Very sudden. What? Wait, that's a super abrupt ending. Yeah, to this it's whole an, an abrupt ending. But part of why I brought I mentioned it at that moment is that there were. Did he finish the inventory? Yeah, he's, he's like going through with the, with the notebook. He was feeling fine. Nobody said he, you know, seemed under the weather at all. And so, Aww. for all of the people who had been upset with him and who had been upset with the whole legal enterprise of trying to sort this out in a courtroom, they said, "Well, he was the first one that the curse of the cobra struck." It was universally no. viewed among his critics as a direct result of messing with, you know, the, that energy under the temple. No. Sundarajan dead at the age of 70. His family, uh, they tried to make it sound like, well, no, you know, he had been ill for a few days, but non-family members were like, no, he was he was at the top of his game. He had just run this successful legal challenge to the royal family. There were no indications he was sick. And then like three weeks after they open up all the vaults, he keels over at home and dies right in front of his family. And he died actually a heartbroken man. Even though things were trending in a good way legally, he was really astounded by the bad PR and the bad public reception to his lawsuit like it just seemed like a no-brainer to him like look we should we should just find out what's under there and we should make sure that at a bare minimum it stays down there that there's not people as you pointed out sneaking down there to take pieces of treasure that the royal family isn't like i don't know what you do with that stuff but right he's coming at it from an altruistic perspective a historical perspective a preservation minded let's keep this intact there's some religious implications this is you know donated material this is isn't for some yeah. family to it all seems rational to us you know to me the other thing when i first heard about this i was like god you know for a country with as much poverty as they have and if there are other temples with this situation yeah. it feels a little bit obscene to have that much wealth just sitting underground but 
for these people, it seems like religion is, I don't know, you know, it's part of daily life in a way that it, in a way that maybe many Americans aren't familiar with and that they have personal relationships with these deities that feel just as important or more important than their daily relationships with other humans. And so there was like, yeah, there was a real, Sundarajan was um, public enemy number one at the, at the height of that fight. And then right afterwards, when all the word starts to go out around the world, well, it's this much treasure and it's looking, it, what the court decides is, okay, we're going to leave the royal family can still operate the temple. They can still be in charge of security at the vaults. They can, you know, all that stuff, but they are not the legal owners as their position was. And they said, Sundarajan is correct, that that is treasure that belongs to Vishnu, who's, so this is going to be the arrangement going forward. Royal family, you're still in charge of the place, but you are not the owners of the treasure. And then they, I think they put in some, some safeguards in terms of like, okay, well, we've seen what's there. We've taken the inventory. Maybe we'll do regular checks from now on to just make sure that that stuff is secure. There's good, right. you know, surveillance, all that stuff. But as a result of him winning that case, like that, he made the case for why the right. royal family. He made the case and he really turbocharged it because when he, you know, he just, he had a lot of credibility both as a, a lawyer and also as a holy man. So when he joined the case in 2009, it, it kind of went on a fast track and it started to get all the headlines. And then in 2011, effectively, they're winning, they're getting the inventory to be taken. He's both wow. at, it's kind of one of the biggest wins in his legal career. It's one of the, to him, it's a big win for his religion and for Vishnu. But as I said, a lot of people feel differently. And then him dying so soon afterward oh, and crazy. not after yeah. a long illness. You know, the if you watch on YouTube, just sort of news coverage of the event, you know, yeah, people say, well, you know, he had it coming. Like he literally got what he had coming. I mean, there's, and they said, oh. listen, you know, one guy says in the interview, he said, they're lucky it was only Sundarajan. If they had gotten into that last vault, which I think does have like, I forget what, th there was a reason why they didn't just go balls to the wall to get into that vault. You know, there was a feeling like, okay, well, this one, it's got pictures, it's got like uh -oh. sculptures of cobras on the outside. Plus, it's got like a wood door, then an iron door, then like a stone thing that we can't really and so they just we've got to get into this vault yeah it literally that's what i'm saying it sounds like indiana jones but part of the thing is like okay well we've already done a lot of work today we've already and this place is incredibly hard to get and into you're putting down your chisels right before we get into the good stuff this makes no sense well because there is a lot of superstition Can we get some people that aren't superstitious to go in there and just tell a us feeling what's builds there. up that like okay we've gotten a lot of uh what we needed done we've gotten it done this other one is both logistically hard to get into and the the people at the temple are saying stuff like if you go into that one every single one of you will die while you're in okay, there but hocus pocus you can get into a vault that was built three thousand years ago i don't understand you can get in, but that's what I'm saying, that India is different from America. It's not just like, oh, the Al Capone might be in there. Okay, let's break open the vault. They're like, all right, we yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. They so they put it off. So that vault has Still never been day. open. So the the to this day, so the the current estimate of twenty billion dollars US is just for the five of the six vaults, and the one that's most protected of all, they haven't opened. So it stands to reason that it's got some probably pretty good jewels in there as well. My point was that in India, like it's not just straightforward like it would be in America. Like, well, we got to get in that last freaking vault. You know, it is like there's a, a feeling of we need to balance religion and legal proceedings. We need to balance people's feelings. And anyway, they did back off. They never opened that one. And the people, <laughs> this one guy who was interviewed is like, he said, it's lucky it was only Sundarajan. If they'd gone into the last vault, every last one of them would have died. And that would be terrible. I'd feel bad. Yeah. I mean, I'd feel bad if it was like a relative, but I mean. Would they let a robot go in there? Yeah. Like the ones that the American cops send in to defuse a bomb. Well, the ones that you just could deliver food on campus like just send in a robot like just like let's you know we'll blast it open the robot goes in just takes a little i break. know i feel like it has to be one of those um what's that company that that we what's the company every you know a couple of years you see a new video of their robot dog right, it's like right. boston technology or whatever It'll those dogs are kind of 
No, but those are getting scary. And those dogs are getting to the point where they can really push over heavy objects. I think you could send in a pack of those robot hounds and they might get in there. I, don't you imagine there's just like, first of all, a hurricane of bats come flying out at you. Then you got to assume the antechamber has the um, that feature we already discussed, the floor that's utterly covered with snakes. I don't know if Indiana Jones is, is already in there or he's just on his way in there, but you got to get in and get out. But regardless, it'd be awesome to just see what the heck it looks like and what's actually in there and you know after that battle over the um padmana baswami temple because they're you know they're temples to other deities around india you know that the people are like oh hold on like have you checked the basement like what's that door down there does anyone have the key yeah i was gonna it would say you know oh in a way it feels scandalous that a church would be sitting there in america you know or christianity you know there's thing like oh we should be ministering to the poor we should be doing and so it'd be like a scandal if there was a church and then there was 20 billion right in down in the basement but if you think about it is that really different from organized religion i'm sure the catholic church has billions of dollars scientology has billions in real estate holding 401ks they got all that stuff they have investments who um scientology oh everybody like their religions it's yeah. just like someone looking over their investments so is tp regarded like in india is he a very well-known figure like would most people know who he is he is well known because you know he yeah most people would would know but i think he's now you know he he, he was like he had great pr his whole life and then at, right at the very end he was a very polarizing figure and people were upset on, on both sides to me it's obscene for a for a temple or a church to be sitting on 20 billion but you know and 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 here what was fascinating to me i was like how did they accumulate statues that that big made of pure gold and there are complaints going all the way back to ancient times ancient rome you can find writing really? where they bitch about india as the sinkhole for the world's silver and gold wow. and what was going on is that in trade of things like spices the feeling was the indians always drive a hard bargain they always get the best of our riches we're sending over all this gold and silver and it just disappears where is it all it's the sinkhole of the world's silver and gold well, now we know where some right. of it went. It went underneath the uh, the temple that the royal family of Travancore wanted to say. You know, it was the owner of. Yeah, I didn't realize. And you know, the other thing I forgot about India, which I looked up for this, I always kind of just assumed like, oh, British Empire, that must have been there for like a long time. But not really. I mean, India was like running its own thing for thousands of years. And then England was there for like 150. And then they were kicked yeah, it out. Yeah, a bizarre period in history when you consider what the heck were the british doing in india like what are you taking over india for uh, first of all you don't even have sunscreen back then what yeah are you doing out here like leave us alone i feel like it was an excuse to wear those helmets you know what i mean uh, maybe they put it under there to hide it from the British. Yeah, you never know. Is it crazy to if we put in some of our own money? You, me, and Lizzie, uh, southwest coast of India. I bet you the water's warm. I will look up if there's a shipwreck there, and then it's like a twofer. It's like we not only do the long range planning, but like maybe we even dive on our first wreck together. But you're not considering some sort of Scooby Doo effort in which you, me, and Lizzie are trying to get into this vault somehow. <laughs> I'd be lying if that hadn't occurred to me. I'm not great with, as you point out, even one cobra, but you know, the idea of like many of them or a curse of the, that, that freaks me out a little, archaeology? the 20 billion, <laughs> the 20 billion us dollars has my attention. I'll put it that way now, but one, <laughs> one thing that would make it harder to get in there is only Hindu worshipers and worshipers of this particular type are allowed in the temple. Well, we're going to have to take a crash course. I'm sure there's some sort of online certification. Maybe. Up. Yeah. yeah, at the same time we're doing the dive certification, maybe we could do the... Um... Right. Oh, I didn't know you were a Hindu minister. Yep. There's <laughs> my online ID. Check uh, it out. Officiated at a wedding last yeah. year in Iowa. I think we would agree that of the three of us, Lizzie is physically the toughest, so maybe she would yes. be the advance party. But, you know, if she needs support, like... I'd be there within 30 minutes. You know, I'd be, like, within a phone call away. I wouldn't be, like, sleeping. I'd be well, half no, asleep. I bet, I mean, like, we would have her backpack full of protein bars and things like this flashlight. I thought you were going to say we'd have her, her back. Not, but we'd have her backpack, and we'd hold it, and then we'd give it to her when she goes off, you know, to do something. Yeah, no, just to be clear, we stay outside the temple, she goes in. Oh, someone has to do the pod. <laughs> Good point. Yeah, we can't have all 
all three of us succumb to the curse of the cobra. I guess we're going to find out how devoted Lizzie is yeah, to the pod. Be exciting. Um, so this was an interesting biography. Yeah, a little bit of a trick, a little bit of a, a gimmick. I mean, you yeah. know, it's like, okay, so the guy, the guy's not Gandhi, but... I mean, great photos, looks as mad as a March hare, but apparently had a brilliant mind yeah. and ultimately was a good lawyer. Looks just absolutely insane in the photos. He needs a shirt. Just needs like a button down. Like, I think I would take him more seriously. I could even handle his weird makeup on the forehead, but I, I think that- Also, I don't know what it is that they're they're serving at that fest, that 56 day festival. He has that kind of manic look that's sort of like- Yeah, the war paint and shirtless doesn't- speak of legal scholar i mean look at that beard it's like a freaking walt whitman like you know but again if he's in beard, a well-fitted like... suit and he's the beard and he doesn't have the war paint then it's like okay you're an interesting guy with the beard this makes him look a little whack yeah and he looks like he, he maybe doesn't blink you know what i mean like he's just like and he's got that kind of smile so you know he was alive with the uh energy of his mission his project his feeling that vishnu was the, the greatest force in his life and he, he wanted to um uh, yeah. serve him you know also part of his thing was like i knew the royal family i was friends with the royal family like this current royal family this current iteration of the royal family it, it ain't royal he's like these descendants they're like the sort of prince harry versus queen elizabeth like it, it's a big drop off and i'm not comfortable <laughs> having them run the show i was gonna take a claw hammer get into that vault and start like pillaging <laughs> so let's keep harry out of it yeah so it's sad it, it's sad that he dies only at yeah. 70 but, but not in vain does it work you know, resulted in in sort of a triumph. Well, you got to think it's gratifying also for him on the other side and for his family that, you know, he landed uh, an episode on our podcast. I mean, it's not, that's kind of a big deal. Yeah, fantastic. Also, I will say if there are any listeners who want to know more yeah. and that would at least be like maybe one or two members of my family, there was a great New Yorker article written like 10 years ago, which was helpful in preparing for this episode. And it's worth is it article it on TP? It is on just the whole thing, the whole phenomenon of the temple and how it came to be that this much, uh, you know, that these riches are just down in a basement in, you know, these ancient vaults. There's that one vault that we still have not seen, you know, the contents of. Yeah, but based on what happened to our hero, I, I, you know, I don't, I think that when he died, I think there really was a feeling like, look, good, we understand basically what's down there. We know there's 20 billion. Do we really need every last object right. like people started to puss out after they <laughs> saw Sundarajan die so you know definitely Lizzie would be the one to take the first crack and then just <laughs> we'll kind of, she'll be the, the canary in the coal mine as far I'm as I'm sure she's going to greatly appreciate your ability to sacrifice her for the good of the pot <laughs> I thought you were going to say my ability in each episode to compare her to some new animal like it was the draft horse now it's the canary I don't know how she is with like dark closed spaces that would be an <laughs> An issue. <laughs> we send like her and two of those like uh, robot dogs from Boston. Right. <laughs> Boston Dynamics. That's right. Is that what it's called? Boston yes. Dynamics? I can watch hours of the footage of those dogs. There's something both cute and funny, but also terrifying about they're those dogs. They're definitely a little dystopian. Something about them feels a little weird. But if there's somebody who could, who could control them and, and get them to do what we need, it would be Lizzie. And yes. so it's just her two robot hound or mechanical hounds and yeah, some um, sort of digging device. I think she could get in there. I, again, I doubt it's not like safe cracking. It's more about like, you know, elbow grease. Like you have to get through the dirt and the, the stone, but there isn't going to be some like complicated safe cracking. No, I mean, there's going to be lots of bats. There's going to be poisonous snakes. I'm not crazy about either of those. Maybe a puma. Uh, I don't know where we are. I mean, if they're in the jungle, <laughs> like, who knows? But like I said, I, you know, I have confidence in Lizzie. And so it's a, it's a perfect segue to figuring out where we're going to do the corporate retreat. In fact, oh, but before we go, do you want to tease where you're going to take us on episode six? I'm not going to tease because I'm very indecisive right now. So there are two biographies I'm considering. They're very different. So I'm not going to tease, but it's going to be good. Okay. Well, whether we do the corporate retreat in Victorville or the UP or India, one thing that we, we do need to do is decide what next season is going to be, whether it's killer shipwrecks, whether it's killer biographies, whether it's killer something else. And maybe that's something that listeners can use the email address, killer shipwrecks at 
gmail.com to give us their opinions. That would be great. And they also should subscribe, rate, like, comment, whatever. It all helps engagement around the globe. And I look forward to next week when we feature uh, more locations of some of our multiple listeners. Yeah. If you're listening again in Slovenia, let us know how you yeah, found us. That we have to know because that that's and that was I think the capital, right? That was uh, Ljubljana, which is the uh, yeah. capital of Slovenia. The largest city. All right, so Dr. Troy, fantastic and unexpected biography this week of someone that I would have never, you know, guessed in a million years. Sundarajan, thank you. Great questions. Take us fantastic. out. Fantastic. Here comes our outro music. We'll have another biography next week. <laughs> 